May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. And in your name we pray. Amen. This morning's title of this morning's sermon is On a Mission from God. On a Mission from God. And one thing I would say that how I understand theology and how I understand the Bible, I think of it visually. So when I'm watching Iron Man, I am thinking of the armor of God in Ephesians. When I saw Wakanda in the Black Panther, it brought me to the New Jerusalem. When I watch Star Trek, I see the church, a place where people from all races and backgrounds and different universes are together, moving together, going into an undiscovered country, going forward into the final frontier. The church for me is a place where we are called to go where no one has gone before. Now, some people are moved, are moved auditorily, they're, they're moved, not auditorily, but yeah, but through music. You know, where the sonic soliloquies of psalms can lead to salvific beautification and beautification, can lead to the oneness with your soul and God. Music can move people beyond themselves toward the divine. And as we see in this morning's scripture from the Acts of the Apostles, we see Paul and Silas in jail for disturbing the peace and advocating customs that are not lawful to Romans to observe or adopt. And Paul and Silas are in jail singing songs in the midst of being arrested, celebrating and loving God in the midst of oppression, being beaten being hurt, just being, you know, being downtrodden, literally, by the Roman authorities, and yet they sing songs of thanksgiving. It's almost what's interesting. It's like I, you know, listening to the scriptures. I thought, in reading the scriptures, I, you got, I went automatically to the civil rights movement. I automatically went to, like, all right, what civil rights we should do? Protest Sunday. So instead of Pentecost Sunday, for this, so next week is Pentecost Sunday, so this week we could do protest Sunday, and we could do protest songs, civil rights songs. That would be kind of cool. But the reality of it is that no matter what songs bring us to joy, we see the gospel message in that. And the irony is, like I said, doing a protest Sunday or a, God, or a civil rights Sunday, which is part of our, just our DNA, it is directly connected to the Acts, in the apostles, the acts of the Apostles. And as we engage the scripture, as you look at it, as we saw in Acts, we have a sister who has been exploited. She is a servant, slave girl, who has a spirit of divination, which is interesting because it's called, you know, a spirit of divination is actually a Pythian spirit or a snake spirit, which is interesting because of the, uh, the god Apollo, who is the, the messenger god. And so, but she gave her owners a great amount of money. And they're in jail, really, because they freed her. Now, when you read this, you can, when you read Acts, there are enough incidents in Acts that can look comedic. You know, I mean, come on, I mean, the guy wants to basically, I mean, come on, this woman who has a spirit of divination, and usually, and what, and what is usually interesting is that you look at it in a bad sense, of course, of demon possession, but the irony is that is she telling the truth? Yes, she is. She's saying exactly what, who Paul is and who Silas is. She is literally preaching the good news. She's saying these are men who are slaves to the most high God, who proclaim to you a way of salvation. And so Paul is annoyed. He is frustrated. He is disturbed by this. And I'm like, for me, Paul, I would think Paul should, like, you know, keep her around. I think Paul should have her as his hype man or hype woman. You know, she could be the flavor flave to Paul's Chub D. You know, you know, if you know, you know, flavor flave, you know, flavor flave, you know, you know. But the irony is, you know, flavor flave is the, 
he's the, the sugar for the medicine of the public enemy group to a certain extent. And since if she wants to be there, so be it. But he was annoyed and he cast her out. And he set her free. Now what's interesting about this is that in that comedic dynamic, and I would say even, even to the point the guy wants to kill himself at the end, you're like, wait a minute, are you serious? He really wants to kill himself because the people got free. Like, is this, you want to think, in terms of reading out, you want to think, is this hyperbole? But, in a good narrative, there's always moments of comedy, distress. It's a good story, but it's also a good truth. And let me just be honest with you, as I said about when I talk about the visual theology, the, how I understand it, the one thing I think about in terms of folks being in jail is, and I would say it's my favorite movie about Christian discipleship, I would say it's the Blues Brothers. Now, where are I going with this? Well, you know, these two men, Juliet Jake and Elwood, are two disciples of the blues, you know, they, were, they grew up in an orphanage and they were taught the ways of actually the African-American tradition, something that gave them solace, something that gave them reality and something that talked to them and preached to them in their souls. They were connected by a man who used to work in the basement, the Cab Calloway character, and I will not do We Made the Moocher this week, I promise. But, in this relationship of, these young Elwood, of this young Elwood and Jelly and Jake, they were converted to the blues. And the movie begins with Joliet Jake getting out of Joliet prison. And then they go and they meet. They go back to the orphanage and they talk to the penguin who is their nun, the nun who ran the orphanage. And she tells them that they're about to run out of money and they're going to close. And then Juliet Jake in church has a conversion moment where he realizes that he will save the orphanage. He will save the orphanage, he will keep it open, and he is now on a mission from God. Now, as we go through the movie, if you actually pay attention to the movie, watch it. It's a great movie. It's, it's, it's more than just you know, SNL. It's, it's interesting to know. Tale, because if you pay attention, as they're on this mission from God, they are shot at. The building that they live in is blown up. They survive. They're shot at. They, their car does magnificent moves of jumps across open expressways that had not been completed in 1979, and it completely ends with them saving the orphanage. And then the final scene, as they run to Cook County, the Cook County offices, and they pay the money, are two handcuffs being placed on each wrist. And then all of a sudden you hear, the next scene is, doom, 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 doom. And that is the intro to Jailhouse Rock. That is the final scene where you see the whole band, all of them, completely and fully imprisoned in the jail doing jailhouse rock. Their mission is completed, and they rock in the jail. Now, like any good movie, and like any good musical, it ends with literally seeing all of the people who helped in that orphanage journey take place. So you see. And, and they all sing a part of the song. So as you watch, if you watch it, you'll see, at the end, you'll see Ray Charles sing a line from Jailhouse Rock. You'll see you know, Aretha Franklin sing a line. You'll see every single person take place and join in in this song of celebration. In the midst of the celebration, they're just rocking them. But they're on a mission from God. What is interesting, though, is that in this scripture is a tale of two masters. As 
The scriptures describe the young lady as a slave or as a servant to these men, and she is being exploited. She describes Paul and Silas as servants to the Most High God. They are both in the same positions. They are both using the same, they are both under different authorities, but using their energies for different results. And where this woman is being exploited, these men are using their mission for exaltation. Where she has been denigrated, they're trying to go somewhere and they're trying to bring people back into dignity. And when Paul sets her free, he ruins a lot of people's lives. He ruins the people who are making money's lives. You know, it just happens. And, but what about her? What about her? As we know about, as we talk about exploitation all the time, and we talk about exploitation of human trafficking, drug use, all different types of things like that, there's a reality of folks who are being used. People are being pimped, if you want to use that word, for money. And it's one thing to be used. It's another to be a useful person in God's eyes. Now, the irony is that God took God's power and God's purpose. And what it means to be God, the irony is that she was being used even under, the, under, under other people's auspices. The irony is that where Paul and Silas are supposedly wrong, well, no. Nah. She was already no good because she was already talking about what Paul was doing. She wasn't doing what they needed her to do. But the question becomes, so then she becomes even a part of this larger mission that is going from being a mission for money, but then to a mission for and from God. And so then the question becomes, who do you serve and for what purpose? And what are the results? Because when we serve God, it goes from talking about exploitation to exaltation. It goes from the idea of denigration to dignity. It goes from gluttonous greed to glorification of souls, where our countenance has become brighter. It goes from reacting to reactionary politics and reactionary relationships to realizations of your potential in God that God gave you from the beginning. Instead of false helps, we have freedom now. And as Corinthians continues to talk about in 2 Corinthians 3, 17, it says, where the Lord, where the, now where the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And freedom was found in this young lady. She was set free before Paul ever did anything. He was just annoyed. And she became a part of the larger mission of the mission of God. So then the question becomes, how do we find freedom? How do we move on that mission? How do we go beyond just saying, yeah, I love Jesus. Jesus is my savior. And God is wonderful to acting it out, living it out, being on a mission beyond just the rote the, the road responses. I guess the reason why I love the Blues Brothers is because of the, the amount of energy and what they are willing to go to get the mission done. And sometimes that's just not as good, you know, let's keep it real. Blues Brothers is a better movie than The Passion. It probably it just is. I've never actually seen The Passion because, you know, it's, you know, it's kind of gruesome and stuff. But, you know, but the reality is when you see the word and you hear the word and you recognize that the word is coming from a different place, you grab onto that word, you run with it. You'd be on that mission. As we... So are you talking more, so are you saying, like, so are, we, are, you, are you talking more about Elwood and, J, Elwood and Jake? Are you talking more about Paul, Saul, Saul and Pat, Paul? I'm talking about both. I'm talking about actually having our minds transformed 
to the point where we see God in everything that we do, that we see God in our transformed living and being. What I'm saying is like, wow, God is in the new crazy Pokemon show. Sure. Well, how? Find out. Let's go on that mission. The mission of God and God's mission is a mission that is all about freedom. It's all about the action. It's all about the, the power of setting folks free. And you, to do that, you have to be able to live it out. It's one thing to say you are free, but then you still act enslaved. What good is it? If you don't act free, if you aren't acting out of the gifts, if you aren't acting out of the fruits of those spirit, of the spirit, then are you free? God's mission is a mission that is lived out in community and love for all. And that is in the sharing and doing of God's word. So if you are on a mission from God this morning, I invite you to join me in the blues, blues mobile. I invite you to join me in the walk of discipleship, the drive to divine excellence, the power of who God is in you and in me already, blessed and highly favored, but not only favored, but more than favored, it's grace. And grace begots grace. Grace begots grace upon grace. It is the I in you and the you in me that is spoken in John. It is the begotting of the love of the Holy Spirit and that spreads through God's church and spreads into the world and seeps to the point where, yes, you think differently and you see everything differently. Where you can see Iron Man in Ephesians, where you can see the love of God and the, the power of the truth in the lasso of truth in Wonder Woman, for example. If you see and you follow and you touch and you're a part of this larger dynamic, that mission pushes us forward and leads us to a new place. So if you're on a mission from God this morning, I invite you to go and I'm going with you. And I got my tie ready. I got my on a mission from God tie. I got my sunglasses, and I got my black Impala, and we're ready to rock and roll. Where are we going? The question is, let's go with God's help. It's not a question. Let's go. Let's go on a mission. A mission from God. Amen, amen. and amen.